You know what is blockbuster? The Kentucky governor race. Yes. So a couple months ago, when we first started this podcast, I mentioned Andy Bashir as a moderate that I actually kind of like. Mm-hmm. And I remember having conversations with my dad and members of my family. And they're like, who do you want to see run for president? And I'm like, I would love to see Andy Bashir in 2028. And yeah. why? Because he's a Democrat who can win in places like Kentucky. He's not a complete sellout like most or some blue dogs like Manchin or Kirsten Cinema. She he's not like that. Um, he has a genuine pretty good track record. And last night, just more evidence in his favor, he beat his opponent opponent, Daniel Cameron, by five something points. Yeah, this was absolutely nuts because Bashir is the only Democrat to win on this entire ballot. Every single other statewide race went Republican. And Bashir still maintains his hold on the governor, the governorship. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, look, it is he. he it's hard to unseat an incumbent governor, right? That's mm-hmm. a very difficult thing to do. But the fact that he won by over five points mm-hmm. is tan- tantamount to his political talent and the messaging that he's employing. Yeah, and so he really ran as this good government nonpartisan guy his main line was a bridge doesn't have a party affiliation right there's no such thing as a democrat or a republican bridge yeah that sounds like joe biden rhetoric to me yeah i mean it's kind of honestly andy Bashir has the rhetoric and the and the uh the reputation that joe biden wish he could have yeah and right? andy Bashir is like like joe biden with a face that's 25 years younger yeah, exactly yeah exactly so daniel cameron Bashir's opponent was the prior attorney general um, endorsed by Donald Trump in the primary and was honestly like McConnell's baby. Really? McConnell has been preparing Daniel Cameron for larger office. Really? For a, for a decade now. Was he like a McConnell aide? He was a was he, he was a McConnell. I think he was a McConnell intern when he was in college. Wow. I mean. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Don, Daniel Cameron has been around McConnell for a while and McConnell has been raising him up to be a rising star for the party. Mm. Um, his career isn't over with this loss. But it's definitely hindered. Yeah, obviously hurts. Yeah, and yeah. so now he doesn't have any political office, so he's gonna have to take some time off and see his next move. Yeah. Um. But I, I want to talk a little bit more about Bashir and kind of why I like him as a Democratic moderate, because again, he's not somebody who becomes a moderate by going back on liberal and progressive values. He doesn't fight against it. It's just not his main focus. But when push comes to shove. He does a lot of the right things. Mm-hmm. One example of this is during the UAW strike. We've covered the United Auto Workers strike a lot, and we're going to talk about the United Auto Workers in great detail this episode. Um, and Andy Bashir made an amazing move as the sitting governor to join the UAW strike picket lines. He went there and he said that I am here for you. He got the UAW endorsement and the UAW has emphatically supported Andy Bashir. And if the UAW is going to emphatically support you, I'm probably going to emphatically support you too. Yeah, absolutely. The fact that you can somehow still straddle this line, that Bashir can straddle this line of being a clearly pro-union governor and still maintaining the office in what is solidly a red state, a state that solidly voted for Donald Trump in each of the past two elections, is incredible. It needs to be a Democratic superstar on their side of the aisle. Absolutely. And this needs to be a showing to all the other moderate Democrats around the country on how to be a good moderate. Yes. This is how you do it. Mm -hmm. You don't be a good moderate by going back on unions. That's not how you be a good moderate. Mm -mm. That's not it. The, the good moderate is able to pull in that white working class vote on top of the people of color working class vote. And that's how you're able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, then the question comes up, like, is do you think he could be a 2028 contender? I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Too. I, I like, again, we talked about this with Biden. He's a progressive with a moderate face uh-huh. or with a moderate voice right? He has figured out how to nail the messaging where people aren't scared of the immense change he's going to make, but he's also going to appoint people, the right people, to positions that they need to be in to move the progressive agenda forward. Absolutely. Andy Bashir during his um, victory speech, the first thing he said was, time to give our teachers a raise. Like, that's awesome. Yes, like, that's, that's exactly what we want. That's exactly what we want, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that progressives aren't going to be super happy seeing like, oh man, what the hell? You guys like some 
Democrat governor from Kentucky, but that's like not what it's about, though. Yeah, well, I guess the the counter argument to what we are saying is. Um, what's the word, the term for the window of like what's okay to talk about? The Overton window. The Overton window, yeah. right? They want someone who's going to move the True. Overton window, right? True. Biden really isn't that person. Bashir probably wouldn't be that person. No. Um, so it is, it's fair. It's like we would need other people to take up that mantle. Right. And we say this a lot though. Like there is a place for hardcore lefties and hardcore progressives in our government And that place is really in the House of Representatives, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's where I feel like that's that type of politician who's on the more radical end, who wants to be the fiery voice, Mm -hmm. can do its most good without risking the whole party up and down the ballot. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I do understand progressives thinking, like you said, like, I don't want to be stuck in this center where we can only elect a, a, you know, a moderate white dude from the middle of the country I don't like that precedent. Yeah. Like, I understand where they're coming from with that. There definitely, I, I think there probably is a way to do both. I think there is a way to communicate really progressive values without completely alienating the other side. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure exactly who does that because part of being kind of a militant progressive almost tends to be having really fiery rhetoric about how dangerous and horrible the other side is. That's very true. And that's alienating in and of itself. Yeah. The fiery, the rhetoric, the language like the world is burning, the language like we're Mm -hmm. at war, it's important, but it's important, I guess, to have because the, 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 the feeling of urgency needs to be prominent. Well, it's important to galvanize the base, yeah. but it's not effective in winning votes from the center. Right. It's not good at persuasion, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Right? But I, I do think, like, I feel like what we try to do on this show, part of why we like doing this show, is because we want to be voices that, like, sound extremely reasonable and level-headed in communicating why the progressive course is correct. Those are the people that I most want in government. I totally agree with you. Yeah.